Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship service here this Lord's Day as we gather together at Redeemer Lutheran Church here in Scottsdale to hear the word of our God, to receive his sacrament, to sing his praise, and to offer him our prayers. Uh, Today we conclude our series on Fix Your Eyes on Jesus. Uh, We have a text today that focuses our attention on how you and I should live as children of God who do fix their eyes on Jesus Uh, And it concludes by fixing our eyes on Jesus, reminding us of that great truth that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We begin our service this morning by singing hymn number 485, O Day of Rest and Gladness.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Let us bow before the Lord and confess our sins. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. I ask each of you in the presence of God who searches the heart, do you confess that you have sinned and do you repent of your sins? Do you believe that Jesus Christ has redeemed you from all your sins, and do you desire forgiveness in his name? Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May he comfort your heart with his holy absolution and strengthen you by his sacraments, that your joy may be full. Peace be with you. We join in reading responsibly the introit. Fear the Lord, you his saints. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. be to God on high.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord of grace and mercy, teach us by your Holy Spirit to follow the example of your Son in true humility, that we may withstand the temptations of the devil and with pure hearts and minds avoid ungodly pride. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson for today is recorded in the book of Proverbs in chapter 25, beginning at verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver, and the smith has material for a vessel. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence, or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. What your eyes have seen do not hastily bring into court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself and do not reveal another's secret, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you and your ill repute have no end. The word of the Lord. Our second lesson, which will serve as our sermon text, is recorded in Hebrews chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Alleluia. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel for the Twelfth Sunday after Pentecost, according to Luke, chapter 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And Jesus said to them, Which of you? having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out. And they could not reply to these things. Now Jesus told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, 
When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus also said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. The Gospel of the Lord. We unite in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us man and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and sent into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with hymn number 444, Take My Life and Let It Be.
Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for this morning is our second lesson from Hebrews chapter 13, uh, where we have that wonderful verse, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Dear friends of our Savior, Christians are ever-changing and yet never-changing. Christians are ever-changing because we are growing people. We are never-changing because we have an unchanging Christ. When we are born, we desire the sincere milk of the Word of God like newborn babes. But as we mature in the Christian faith, then we begin to chew on the meat of God's Word, growing ever more in knowledge and understanding, in faith and in love, relying on the Savior more day after day. Even in death, Christians are changing. We are changed from glory into glory. We are changed from the glory of having Jesus by faith in this world to the greater glory of having Jesus by sight in heaven. So you see, Christians are always changing because we're always growing. Justification, that is a constant state of being declared righteous, being forgiven before our God. But sanctification is an ongoing process that the Spirit works in our life as we grow in our faith. By the same token, Christians never change. Christians never change because Jesus never changes. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. The Jesus in whom you and I believe never changes, and therefore you and I never change, need, never should change what we believe about Jesus. The Jesus who has spoken to us in his word never changes, and therefore you and I cannot pretend that the words that Jesus spoke have changed or even changed in meaning. The Jesus in whom we live has never changed, and therefore the way we live in Jesus dare never change as well. Today we are reminded that we have a changeless Christ, and therefore we are changeless Christians. Since we are changeless Christians, our text invites us to continue with brotherly love. Do not change the way Jesus wants you to love other people and each other. You might remember in the Greek language there's four different words for love, while the English language has only one. In the English, uh, uh, Greek language, there is eros, that is the unique love the, between a husband and wife that is supposed to be restricted to marriage. There is sterge. Sometimes people haven't heard of sterge. Sterge is a unique love that a parent has for a child. And I think you would have to agree, if you have children, that is a unique love. And the Greek language has a special word for it. Then there is agape, that unconditional love that God showed to us in Jesus Christ. This is the deepest kind of love imaginable. It's the kind of love also that God wants us to show when the Bible tells us to love God above all and love our neighbor as ourself. That is that unconditional love. And the fourth kind of uh, love in the Greek language is Philadelphia, brotherly love. That's the most common kind of love in the world. It has to do with the social graces. It has to do with being kind to other people and patient with them. It has to do with the essence of the golden rule that we should treat others as we ourselves would like to be treated. It may surprise you that when the author here encourages the Hebrew Christians and you and me to continue in love, he doesn't tell us to continue in this agape love, this unconditional love that reflects the love of God. He simply says, continue in brotherly love. It's a kind of love that the Lord wants to be shown throughout the world, but he especially wants to see that kind of love in 
the Christian church and specifically in a Christian congregation. He wants us to show love and not to change the way we show love as the world grows older. To help us understand, he gives us three examples of people that we are to show brotherly love to. They are the stranger, the imprisoned, and the mistreated. Paul was put in prison for preaching the gospel more times than he relates in the New Testament. He also was severely mistreated many times for his faith in Jesus as his Savior. He was stoned, he was flogged, he was beaten, he was starved, he was left naked. Of course, Paul isn't the only one who suffered under the uh, Roman Empire. Many Christians suffered under the Roman Empire empire as well. Millions have suffered for their faith after, and being imprisoned and suffering for one's faith is still very common in the world today, if not in the United States of America. Remember those who are strangers. And the way we show brotherly love to these people is to show hospitality to them. That is brotherly love. Now, when the text here tells you and me to show hospitality to strangers, he's talking about within the context of the Christian church. During Roman persecution days, it was not uncommon for Christians to have to leave one country and go to another, to go from one city to another city, to go from one house to another house. As these refugee Christians would flee persecution, they went to a new place and there they looked for that familiar sign of the fish on somebody's front door or close to it. They would knock on the door, <clears throat> identify themselves as a Christian why they are there, and they would be welcomed into the home of those Christians. Normally someone they'd never met before. That's the kind of hospitality that God wants us to show to our fellow Christians. And in doing so, he says, you might even entertain an angel unawares, just like Abraham and Sarah did by the trees by Mamre. He also wants us to show brotherly love, keep on showing brotherly love to those who are imprisoned and those who are mistreated. Again, I said this was a common thing back then. But notice the way that the text says we should remember those Christians who have been imprisoned for their faith and who are mistreated in their day-to-day -day life by those who oppose Christianity. He simply says, remember them. Remember them. Remember them in your prayers. Remember them in your heart. Remember them with any words and actions you can show to them. Remember them in Christ. Certainly, these are great ways for Christians to show brotherly love to other people. And since brotherly love has not changed from the days of Jesus, nor has it changed from the days of the Bible being written, so also, we dare not change the way God wants us to show brotherly love yet today. Having shown us this way to brotherly love, he turns our attention to the life that we live. And since Jesus is not changing, Christians dare not change the way they live their Christian lives. He gives two examples here uh, of ways Christians change their lives, along with the world, unfortunately. They are two culprits that have upset the world in many ways, have upset homes and families, even destroyed them, and Christians have not been immune. 
They are two common things that you might expect. If you ever have done marriage counseling, you will see these two things rise to the top of problems within marriages, and that includes within Christian marriage. And those two things are sex and money. The writer here gives us instructions about having the right approach to these things, especially how we should not abuse sex and money. The statistics on sexual sins among Christians are shameful. We need to understand that the statistics of sexual sins among Christians is shameful. The statistics tell us that Christians commit sexual sins at the exact same rate or proportion as the unbelieving world does. That surprises people. Young Christian people live together without being married at the same ratio as their unbelieving peers. Christians watch pornography at the same ratio as non-Christians do. Adultery happens in Christian marriages at virtually the same proportion as they happen in unbelievers' marriages. Divorce happens among Christians virtually the same as it happens in the unbelieving world around us. Homosexuality is just as common among the greater Christian church as it is in the society in which these people are living. You and I tend to get conditioned along with the world to accept that which is dirty or filthy or immoral in television and on movies. If things you see on television today would have been seen in the 1950s when my mom and dad bought our first television, they would have junked the television. But today we simply watch it and act like nothing has happened. Romance novel, novels are very popular in part because they give very descriptive and racy scenes of illicit affairs. And we get conditioned to not even be upset with these things any longer. That God wants us to live a chaste and pure life is made very clear here in our text. Let marriage be honored among all. Don't give up the institution of marriage. Honor it. And let the marriage bed be kept pure or undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. The sexually immoral here, the word in Greek is the word for fornicators. And it's referring to single people who commit sexual sins of any kind. And adulterers here are married people who commit sexual sins of any kind. We need to be careful that we do not be swept along with the media and advertisements, the internet, so that we're slowly allowing things to come into our body through visual and sound that God doesn't want us to have. Luther's explanation of the Sixth Commandment still endures that we should live a chaste and decent life in word and deed. We dare not live as though Christian purity is no longer a Christian value. It is. And the same is true with the other culprit in people's lives, and that is the culprit of money, or the love of money, I guess we would say. says, Keep your life free from the love of money in our text and be content with what you have. The love of money shows itself in many ways. It can be the workaholic who does nothing but work to earn more money at the expense of his church and his family. It can be an undue compulsion or even addiction to go to the local casino or to play the lottery, especially when the jackpot gets up there in that billion dollar range like it just recently did, and people rush to buy as many tickets as possible, even though your odds are one in 186 million of winning anything. It can be found in the mentality that we see on television where 
we should sue anybody and everything for anything that comes along in order to get what you deserve. It's that mentality where television commercials say it's free and everything should be. It's that mentality where somebody who is perfectly capable of working has found a way to beat the system and go on to government welfare. The love of money is there. But the Bible here says contentment is a Christian virtue. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Don't pretend that contentment is no longer a Christian virtue. It is. Just as Christian love flows from a Christian life, so also a Christian life flows from the Christian faith. And so our text also focuses our attention on why our Christian faith dare never change. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. I think it's rather interesting that our text here says that we should treat our spiritual leaders the same way we treat the imprisoned and the mistreated. The word remember is used in all three cases. I have a hunch that was intentional. That word remember means more than simply recalling. It's the same word the thief on the cross used on Good Friday when he looked at Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. The thief on the cross wasn't simply saying, Lord, when you die and go to heaven, well, I'll remember you died with me and let it go at that. No, he was saying, remember Jesus, remember me. I'm the one who, dying next to you, confess my sins to you and to the entire crowd that was gathered there at the foot of the cross on Good Friday. And I'm the one who turned to you in faith, looking to you as the only one who can take a thief, a murderer, and an insurrectionist like me to heaven at the moment I die as well. Remember your spiritual leaders who spoke to you the word of truth. Remember them in your heart, in your prayers, in Christ, and for what they have spoken to you and what they have done for you. Remember the pastor who baptized you. Remember the pastor who, when you went to Sunday school, uh, was teaching you his word, sometimes directly, sometimes through his teachers. Remember the pastor who gave you confirmation instructions. Remember the pastor who confirmed you. Remember the pastor who preached to you and gave you the Holy Supper in church on Sunday. Remember your leaders who spoke to you the word of God. Because you see, when we hear a message like the one we have today, yes, we're sitting in church and we're saying, yes, Lord, I can do these things. But it doesn't take us very long to realize that we have come up short in doing what God wants us to do. Would you be willing if somebody you never met before said, I'm from one of the ELS missions in a different country, let's say Peru, and I'm here as a refugee and I need a place to stay, would you be willing to take them into your home on that word? You hear about Christians who are in prison. Have you done anything for them, even said a prayer? You hear about Christians who are mistreated around the world because of their faith. Have you remembered them in Christ? Maybe done what you could by way of an offering or a gift to help them or said a prayer for them? And what about those sexual sins that are so prevalent in our society where we get simply coaxed along with the world? It's easy to sit here in church and say, well, yeah, I don't have a problem in that area. And yet, if you go home this afternoon and a TV show comes on that has some suggestive or even worse dirty things in it, 
Do you turn it off right away? A few years ago, there was a television person uh, who had the graveyard shift at a television station in New Jersey. And he had to be there all night, and he was the only one there, and he put something on TV. And then he decided off and on that he would spend his time sitting there alone using another monitor to watch a pornographic film. Well, one day, he pushed the wrong button, and the pornographic film went on the air from about 2 to 4 in the morning. You can well imagine that hundreds of people dialed in, or punched in, to complain that that, stadium, that station would play such a dirty, filthy movie to the public. But you know what's interesting? Of all the hundreds of people that called in, not one called in until the movie was over. That's human nature. That's sinful human nature. Does our sinful human nature sometimes betray us? And what about money? It's easy to say here, yes, I'm content with what I have, but I have a whole lot. What if God allowed Satan to do to you what he allowed Satan to do to Job? Take all your possessions and money away in one day, as well as your children, your sons and daughters-in-law and grandchildren. Would you still say what Job said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away? If God stripped you down to everything but the bare essentials of food and clothing, would you, as the Bible says, be there with content? If God decided to do with us what he decided to do with the children of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness, give them nothing but manna day after day, year after year, decade after decade, might not we say with Israel, finally, we detest this miserable food rather than being thankful and content with it? But then there's Jesus. Then there's Jesus, the same yesterday today, and forever. That's a comfort to you. That means that the Jesus who died on the cross to pay for the price of every one of your sins and to forgive them before his heavenly Father is the same Jesus, he has not changed, who willingly and freely forgives your sins today. Every time we come up with something we have done short and fallen short of the glory of God, Jesus forgives us when we bring our sins to him and pray, Lord, forgive us our trespasses. And we can be confident that he does and will and will forgive us until the day we get into heaven when we no longer need forgiveness. And the same Jesus who rose from the dead on Easter Sunday to give us newness of life has not changed in his resolve to renew your life every day so that every morning you start with a new slate to live your life to the glory of God. And he will renew your life until the day you die, and then he will renew it in perfection in heaven. Fix your eyes on that Jesus. It's the only way to have eternal life. Jesus never changes. And by fixing your eyes on the changeless Christ, you can find the only way to be a changeless Christian. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Holy Spirit, who instilled in us through the word and sacrament faith in Jesus and gave us salvation through him, make us diligent students of our Savior's word. Help us understand and remember the scriptures so that our faith may be nurtured and enjoy a steady growth. Enable us to apply the spiritual lessons we learn from the word to our daily lives. As we grow in faith, continue to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the same yesterday and today and forever. Remove from us all thoughts, all speech, all desires, and all deeds which do not glorify God. Give us the power to refuse temptation and shun sin. Teach us acts of love and mercy so that we do not forget the stranger, the imprisoned, or the mistreated. Keep our hearts in the Christian virtues of purity and contentment. Be with Odin, Harold, and Roger, as well as all who are infirm or shut in. Be their refuge and strength each day. Continue to let your blessing rest upon Pastor Hendricks as he considers and takes to heart the divine call we issue to him to be our next full-time pastor. Help him see the needs of our congregation as well as the needs of Faith Lutheran Church, which he now serves. Let our communicants come to your altar with penitent hearts, filled with faith in Jesus as their Savior, to receive the forgiveness the sacrament offers. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way to everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, As our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
we continue with the distribution of the sacrament, please come forward in about 15. Others may be seated at this time. And may the true body and blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Rejoice, your sins are forgiven. Depart in peace. Amen. Your sins are forgiven. Be part of peace.
Please stand as we join together in singing the Dunk Dimittis. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule their hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn. It's hymn, uh, verse number four of hymn number 239, I Lay My Sins on Jesus.
Welcome again this Lord's Day to our divine service here at Redeemer Lutheran Church. Uh, just a reminder that uh, keep on praying for uh, Pastor Hendricks as he makes a decision uh, whether to accept our call here to Redeemer or to remain at Faith Lutheran in Oregon, Wisconsin. I did have the privilege of talking to him yesterday, so I gave him uh, a few insights that I have. Um, I know that Pastor Weber also talked to him yesterday. I asked if many people from the congregation did. He named a few names, so a few more can do that. I do remind you that the members at Faith are talking to him constantly to stay at Faith. Uh, so we need our people also to talk to him, to encourage him to come and be our pastor here and to just give him a friendly greetings if nothing else and say you're praying for him, either by phone, by email, or some other means. I don't think there's any other uh, announcements for today. We'll see you at Bible class. <laughs>